Hello folks. In this video I'm going to show you how I repurpose cells that I salvaged from industrial robot batteries to build a battery for my new electric motorcycle. I had purchased three of these 36 volt battery modules from batteryhookup.com which contain the M50LT cells that I'm after. The M50LT is a 4.8 amp hour lithium ion cell made by LG and it can deliver 14 amps continuous and up to 20 amps of peak discharge current. After testing them at around 1C, I found that even these used cells are still holding around 98% of their rated capacity, which is a good indication that they still have lots of life left in them. They're also matched and balanced really well, but in order to make them work for my project, I need to tear down the old modules and rebuild them into a 16P20S configuration to provide 76 amp hours at 74 volts nominal for the bike. Besides saving money, one of the great things about repurposing old batteries is all of the extra parts that you get with the cells. I've heard some people claim that this grey material provides some sort of cooling effect, but from what I can tell it's just silicone putty used to fill the gap between the battery and the case to keep it from flopping around and shorting out on something inside. But I could be wrong, so I'll put it in a bag and save it with everything else anyway. You can see the positive and negative connections are all exposed after removing the grey material, so I immediately covered them with tape to prevent shorting something while it's being disassembled. I use builder's tuck tape because as a carpenter I have a lot of it on hand so it's just more convenient to use than ordering Kapton tape. Tuck tape is made of polypropylene which has excellent dielectric strength and arc resistance so it's a suitable alternative despite being made for sealing building insulation and sheathing. The modules also have a BMS built into them but they can only handle 30 or 40 amps at 36 volts so I remove those and save them for a future project. The bottom of the modules have a sheet of plastic glue to them, and I found that heating it up to around 50 degrees Celsius made it a lot easier to peel off, but there's always a mess left behind. Once the glue was cleaned off, I checked the voltage of each of the P groups to make sure they matched. The nickel strips were both welded and epoxy to the cells, but they were too thin to handle the current that the new configuration will provide, and cleaning all the glue and epoxy off to get a good connection for layering more strips over the originals seemed to be more work than they were worth, so I decided to remove the strips and bus bars completely and start from scratch. I remove the strips very carefully by using a small, dull wood chisel to pry the strips away from the cells and using the cell holder for leverage to avoid prying against the cell itself. These are not like the LFP cells that I've worked with in the past. They have a different chemistry to provide a higher energy density and are more unstable as a result, so they can burst into flames if they're punctured. When working with cells like this, it's best to keep a fireproof container and a fire extinguisher within arm's reach, and of course wear protective gear. After the strips are removed, the spot welds are still left behind, so I clean those up with a Dremel tool, again being very careful not to puncture the cells. Then I removed any remnants of the epoxy that might be left behind with some fine sandpaper.
Two of the modules just needed the strips removed, but the third module also needed to be split in half, and each half combined with the other two whole modules, so I worked on that next. Once the modules were combined, I could start reconnecting the cells using 8mm wide by 0.2mm thick pure nickel strips and my new K-Weld spot welder. This material can only handle around 7 amps continuously, so I'm using two layers to connect the 16 cells in each column of the modules in parallel first. This will allow the full rated cell current to flow with little resistance between each cell when they equalize as a parallel group and act as one larger cell. After the cells in each column were connected in parallel, I then connected the P groups in series, again using two layers of 8mm by 0.2mm nickel strips at each cell location. This ensures that each cell can safely transfer the full rated current to the adjacent cell in the next P group. With 16 double layered strips forming the series connections between each P group, and with each double strip handling 14 amps continuous, the series connections can handle a total of 224 amps continuous, which is around 25% more than the continuous current rating for the motor that I'm using. Once the nickel strips were connected, I covered them with vinyl tape and soldered 20 gauge balance wires to the top of each series connection between the P groups. These will be connected to the BMS later, which will use them to monitor the voltage of each P-group during use to provide some protection against overcharging or over-discharging, over-current, over-voltage, etc., as well as provide some passive balancing while it's charging. It's generally a good idea not to solder lithium cells because the heat could damage them, and usually when I do need to involve soldering, I'll solder the nickel strips before welding them on. But in this case I got ahead of myself, and the balance wires can be placed anywhere on the series connection anyway, so I soldered them in the middle of the strips to keep the heat away from the cells, then I wound them through the conveniently placed tabs in the top of the cell holders to hold them in place as well.
Next, I needed a way to connect the battery to the speed controller. So I drilled and bent some 1 8 inch thick by 3 quarter inch wide copper bus bar material to connect to the positive and negative sides of the modules using 14 gauge wire, ring connectors, and stainless steel machine screws at each cell location, similar to the nickel strips. The bus bars can each handle around 25% more than the total continuous current demand from the motor, and the 14 gauge wire and ring connectors can handle the same 14 amp current as the double layered nickel strips. After connecting the ring terminals, I placed a small amount of 5 minute epoxy around the base of the screws to help lock them to the bus bar and prevent them from vibrating loose over time, with the added bonus of sealing and protecting the connection from moisture like condensation. The bus bar for the positive side of each module is a bit different from the negative side, with an extra bar that's bent to connect to the bottom of the other before returning to the top of the module. But this is for good reason. If the bus bars on each side were identical, then the current being pulled through the battery would choose the path of least resistance, which means it would flow directly through the cells in the top of the battery only, and the rest of the cells would trickle charge to the top cells to equalize afterward, as shown in the picture. This would lead to the top cells being worked harder and degrading a lot faster than the rest, if it doesn't damage them completely from the start. To prevent that, the current needs to be pulled through the middle of the battery to share the load directly with more cells, and the best way to do that is to make it exit the battery at the opposite end that it started, as shown. This will help more cells to work more efficiently and degrade at a more similar rate so the battery lasts longer before it needs to be serviced or replaced. I then soldered the 14 gauge wires to a nickel strip so that the solder joint lands between each cell when the strip is welded to them later. After the bars were connected, I placed a piece of ABS between the positive bars to keep them from touching and give the current a shortcut to the top of the module. Then I wrapped them in vinyl tape as well. To 
help hold the bars in place when I'm connecting cables for the controller later, I printed a vented carbon fiber PETG cap that fits over each module and secures the top of the bars. I would have done this in one piece, but my 3D printers aren't large enough, so I printed them in three pieces and connected them with 5 minute epoxy. This will be reinforced further by the cases that will house and protect each module. Once the epoxy was cured, I connected the modules together in series with a battery cable and connected the balance wires to the JST connector provided by the BMS manufacturer and checked the voltage between each P group to make sure that I connected them in the right sequence and that the voltages matched. The BMS that I'm using is a daily that's rated for 250 amps continuous. It has a built-in fan for better cooling and also comes with Bluetooth so the user can connect to their app to view information about the condition of the battery or make changes to certain settings. It's just a passive BMS so it's limited in its balancing ability compared to an active BMS, but it's affordable and it does have all the necessary features for protecting a lithium battery when it's discharging or charging. BMS is connected as shown in the diagram and according to the sequence that daily details in their instructions that are provided with it. After the BMS was connected, I pressed the activation button on the Bluetooth dongle to wake it up, then opened the app on my smartphone to check that it's working. If the BMS is turned on, then a device name will appear on the first screen after opening the app. Clicking that will take you to the main status screen, which gives you information about the state of charge, the battery voltage, discharge and charge current, temperature, as well as individual cell voltage. You can see that the voltage difference between the cells is less than half a millivolt, so they were balanced really well to begin with. This page is also where error codes will appear if there's ever a problem, and right now it looks like everything is fine with the exception of the state of charge meter, which should be reading around 95% at 82.8 volts. But that won't ever be correct after it's first booted up because it depends on the battery specs which the user needs to set in the parameter settings. The first section under parameter settings shows all of the default protection settings like over voltage and under voltage, over discharging and over charging, cell volt difference, etc. The next section allows you to set the amp hour rating for your battery, the nominal voltage of your cells, and when you want to trigger balancing. You can also change the state of charge meter here, which I'll do now to show you how, but it's best to do this after the battery's been cycled a few times, then fully charged and left to rest for about 24 hours. After that, set the meter to 100% in the app, and it should keep track of how many kilowatt hours you use or put back into the battery, and compare that with the amp hour rating that you entered to match the state of charge meter accordingly. In order to save any settings that you change here, you need to click the set button and enter a passcode. The default factory code is 123456. The next section covers information about how many strings and temperature sensors you're using. The section after that covers the temperature protection settings. And the last section allows you to enable or disable the charge and discharge switches manually, perform a factory reset, or change your password. After going back to the main status page, you can see that the state of charge meter now shows 95%. But again, I'll probably have to change that after I cycle the battery a few times in the bike. But it won't hurt anything being inaccurate until then. It's just there for the user's reference. Everything else is based on the protection settings. That's it for this video. I haven't decided exactly how I'm going to encase the modules yet. Vacuum forming ABS like I did for the modules in the buggy would be quick and simple, but these cells are going to get a lot warmer than the LFPs, so I'm not sure ABS will be suitable. Aluminum could withstand and transfer heat better, but it's also harder to work. I specifically built the battery into two separate modules so they can be spaced apart an inch or so in the bike for better forced air cooling though, and to make it lighter to install. But after I figure out how to encase them, I'll get them wired up in the bike and take it for a quick test ride to see how the suspension will work, and I'll cover that in the next video. Until then, take care folks.